So we will be sending out the recording to everybody afterwards. And um, please just click there that you can uh, acknowledge that. So without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce Wendy Herbert, who is the president and CEO of Life Sciences BC to start the webinar. So thank you again for attending and have a wonderful day. Thanks very much, Ryan. Welcome everyone and happy new year. Life Sciences BC is pleased to once again host the, Can the Canada Gardner Public Lecture Series presented by TELUS Health. Life Sciences BC has been partnering with Gardner on this event for the last three years and it's our privilege to do it again. While we're sorry we're not here in person, one of the advantages of it being virtual is that we're able to present this lecture series to a broader geographical audience. Prior to the event and looking at the guest list, we have people from all across Canada and a couple um, from the US. So thank you very much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you be able to participate. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining this event from within the ancestral, traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Salatooth First Nations. Most of our speakers are joining us from other traditional territories across this beautiful country and province. Welcome everyone. For those of you that do not know, Life Sciences BC is a non-governmental, not-for-profit organization. Our members consist of academia, research institutions, centers of excellence and funding agencies, small and medium and global digital health, med tech, therapeutics companies, and those organizations that support and pro provide services to the broader life sciences ecosystem. We are fully funded through membership and the generous contributions of our sponsors and partners. At each event, we'd like to introduce our newest members. And these are the China Service Management, um, iProgen and WPD Pharmaceuticals. Welcome. We're always welcoming new members, so if you have any questions about Life Sciences BC and membership, please do not hesitate to reach out to any one of us or join our website. Okay, and now on to the program. We are thrilled to have such a well-renowned um, speaker today. Dr. Janet Rossant is a senior scientist and chief of research emeritus at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto and president and scientific director of the Gardner Foundation. She's an internationally recognized developmental and stem cell biologist, exploring the biology of early embryo and its stem cells and their applications to understanding and treating human disease. She has also been actively involved in ethics and public policy discussions around stem cell research and genetic modifications. She led the Research Institute at the Hospital for Sick, for Sick Children from 2005 to 2015. She's received many honors and recognition for her work, including six honorary degrees, an election to the Royal Societies of London and Canada and the US National Academy of Sciences. In 2018, she received the North American L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Award. So thank you for joining us and welcome Dr. Rassan. Thank you, Wendy. It uh, really is a pleasure to be here, albeit virtually, in Vancouver today. And I really have the opportunity to be the Gairdner speaker in this partnership that we've had with Life Sciences BC for several years now. And I want to take this opportunity to sort of set the Gardner Awards in the context of COVID. That's an interesting combination, I guess. But here we are. This is what the Gardner Awards are all about. We give out every year international awards to the best scientists who've made discoveries and research that's had impact on human health, both in uh, the North, but also through global health activities as well. And it's wonderful to celebrate research excellence because by celebrating research excellence, we recognize that science is fundamental to society and to our issues such as the pandemic today. But when we give out awards, we don't just give awards, we really want to use the opportunity of celebrating excellence to bring leaders, the awardees, the laureates and others to Canada in person or in more recently virtually to give symposia, public lectures like this one and other kinds of activities that really will allow us to inspire the next generation of science, scientists and innovators. So as president of the foundation, I have a huge opportunity. It's fantastic. I'm connected to some of the very best scientists in the world. And so whenever you get a new problem 
I know that there are people out there that I can call on to help me understand what's going on. And so it's from the learnings of the Gerdner laureates and other scientists that I want to talk to you today about science in the time of COVID, focusing particularly on international collaboration and the roles that Gerdner awardees and others have had, and then touching on some Canadian success stories because we really want to make sure that everybody understands this is an international activity that we all take part in. So what am I gonna talk about? A bit of science around COVID. What do we know about the virus, that nasty virus that you saw, beautiful picture on the previous page. It's a pretty virus, but it's really nasty. How does it work? How can we treat and prevent this disease? And how have international collaborative efforts made a difference? And again, touching on Canadian efforts that have been at the forefront. And then at the end, I just wanna to touch briefly on coming out the other side and the lessons that we can learn for society and for science. So COVID-19 is caused by a coronavirus and coronavirus diseases are not new. We've known about them for a very long time. Um, and in fact, sorry, Oops, sorry. No, 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 sorry. Sorry. The, the, the coronaviruses have been around for a long time. They infect many different organisms. And many of the common cold viruses that we have are coronaviruses. So it's nothing new. And of course, we also know that it's a very famous coronavirus that hit Canada, and particularly those of us who are in Toronto remember very well in 2003. The first SARS virus, SARS-CoV-1, came into Canada and caused an outbreak of a very serious respiratory infection called SARS. And that SARS virus is highly related to the COVID-19 virus, which is now called SARS-CoV-2. Um, and SARS and the, the, all the coronaviruses are what we call zo zoonotic diseases. They have a natural host, usually thought to be bats. So this is an en endemic in bats, but they can change and alter and go through intermediate hosts of different sorts and then into humans. So for SARS, it went through a number of intermediate hosts, including domestic cats. There was a second outbreak of something called MERS, which was another COVID related, uh, a COVID related uh, virus. The intermediate host was camels. So this was a Middle Eastern outbreak. And then of course we have now COVID-19, where we think again, it probably the host is that the, but the natural host is bats. It's not clear yet what the intermediate host is, but of course COVID-19 is where we're at today. So it's not new. And in fact, just the very soon uh, after the outbreak of the disease, giant Chinese scientists isolated the virus, worked out the genome sequence and shared that worldwide. And that was an important starting point for understanding how this disease works. Sorry, I'm having trouble moving my slides, hold on. So just to think a little bit though about pandemics and why uh, and how uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 sits in the field of pandemics. And this is a, a chart taken from the WHO, which I think tells you what you have to think about in terms of risks of outbreaks. Two real components, transmissibility, how easy is the disease spread from person to person, low to high, and of course, mortality, severity of the disease from low to high. And there's SARS in the middle there at about from 2003 at a very high mortality, but luckily a low transmissibility, probably because people were so sick, they couldn't actually spread the disease. Then if we go down to seasonal flu, it's in the bottom quartile, low, for, low mortality and high transmissibility. So it spreads easily, but it's not particularly serious. The most important and the most uh, deadly pandemic uh, of recent times was the 1918 flu pandemic. And you see it sitting in the top quartile there with a high fatality rate and high transmissibility and millions of people died. So where does COVID-19 sit? Well, unfortunately, also in that top quadrant, high transmissibility because it can be transmitted by asymptomatic people and unfortunately a fairly high mortality rate. And of course, as we know, not just mortality, but long-term effects that, uh, of people who recover from the disease. So this is a very serious global pandemic. So how does it actually get into our cells? So we know that the virus comes in through our respiratory tracts, through our nose and into our lungs, and it infects the respiratory epithelium. And it does that through a receptor on the cell surface. And all coronaviruses do this. So that little, that pretty virus we saw at the beginning with the little 
things sticking out, those are called the spike proteins. And the spike protein on the outside binds to a molecule on the cell surface, which is called ACE2. And you see it here, I'm gonna come back to it, so remember it. ACE2 is a gene that we use for different purposes. It's not there as a receptor for the SARS virus, but the SARS has taken advantage of it binds through the spike protein and allows the virus to be internalized into the cells, whereupon the virus breaks down and the genetic information, which actually is RNA in this case, goes into the cells and is taken up and used. You don't need to see, understand the details here, but basically our machinery, our protein production machinery, makes more, more viral proteins, more RNA, wraps it up and pushes out new viruses into the uh, surrounding uh, airways. So essentially gets into the cells and makes your respiratory epithelial cells become a virus factory. Therefore, that's how it's spread. As we talk moistly, cough, sneeze, sing, anything that sends particles from our respiratory epithelium out into the air allows transmission to people who are close by, which is why the main prevention technologies for this disease are still masking physical distancing and avoiding indoor crowds. That is the best way to prevent transmission. It is a very complex disease. Over the last months, clinicians have seen different kinds of symptoms coming up and different uh, severity in different patients, which is still not fully understood at all. Why do have some people have practically no symptoms and other people get very, very sick? Obviously some of it is due to comorbidities, but there must be genetic and environmental factors as well. So that these are just some of the symptoms that come up. Some of these may be primary, some of them are secondary because of inflammatory responses to the viral infection, but it is a very, very serious disease. Over the last few months, clinicians have learned to improve patient management. So the mortality rate is lower than it was at the beginning, but it's only improving and it's, there is no curative treatment at this point for COVID-19. There have been many attempts to repurpose drugs, some of them uh, uh, put forward by uh, President Trump and others without any basis in fact, um, but essentially no, none of those repurposed drugs at this point have proved to be very effective. Uh, there is only really one treatment that has had some effect on severe patients and that's treating patients with steroids like dex dexamethasone to reduce the inflammatory response in severely affected patients. There's been a big WHO trial, clinical trial on all these repurposed drugs worldwide, a global trial, and I'll come back to that a little bit later, uh, which basically said, mm -mm, we don't have anything yet. Which is not to say that there couldn't be some small molecule treatments, but they're not available right now. So that's why public health measures remain the best pre prevention. So given all that, this is what we know, and we know that, and we know we get to that point because scientists, have been rapidly involved in pursuing COVID-19 research. I'm gonna use this word here, pivot. I think it's one of those words that we need to throw away when we come out of the pandemic, but it actually is the right word to say that scientists worldwide pivoted their research once COVID-19 came along. And they used their different skill sets to address different aspects of the, of the disease entities. Uh, improved testing, thinking about treatments, developing vaccines, public health issues, mental health issues, all of that happened because of the long-term investment worldwide in developing scientific excellence, the kind of excellence that Gerdner recognizes, and also built on the principles of open science, collaboration, sharing information, getting the genome sequence out rapidly was absolutely critical to kick-starting all the other efforts, for example. And Gerdner has been very happy to recognize open science through our award of the Canada Gardner Whiteman Award last year to Guy Rouleau, uh, who has been a major proponent of open science and open collaboration, turning the Montreal Neuro into an open science institute. And he has an article here in the Globe and Mail talking about how open science is so important for COVID. COVID. So congratulations to Guy. So that's one way that Gardner can say, we have recognized the importance of collaboration and research excellence. What about our general awardees? Can we find some examples where the excellence of research that we've invested in across different areas has contributed to COVID? Actually, there's lots. Almost all of our uh, Gardner awardees are working one way or another on COVID research right now. But I'm going to give you a couple of examples. One around global health, because this is a global pandemic. 
And then the other, perhaps a little, not quite so obviously, around CRISPR and how CRISPR can be used to also have an impact uh, on COVID-19. So our global health laureates, all of them, essentially, as I, I did a survey of this and I've talked to them, we've had them on our webinars over the year, they're all involved in the COVID pandemic because this is, this is fundamental to their expertise in really trying to make sure that research has an impact on uh, global inequities in health. Um, just a, the most famous of our global health laureates in this area is probably Tony Fauci on the top end there. You see an article from Cell. Of course, Tony Fauci has been the sensible voice of science in the Trump regime and really has been a leader worldwide in promoting the importance and careful science in the development of vaccines. But all our other awardees are there and they've pivoted too. So the Abdul Karims uh, in South Africa have been front and center in the South African response. And actually at the bottom right, Karisha Abdul Karim was part of this solidarity trial from WHO that I just mentioned about repurposing drugs. So we're using in the South African context. Um, uh, Cesar Vettora in Brazil is a, a maternal health researcher but seeing the problems, huge problems in Brazil has been absolutely turned around to do large scale serological surveys for SARS antibodies. Chris Murray and his colleagues at the University of Washington are disease modelers and they have been one of the main uh, 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 centers of perfor performing disease forecasting models for COVID-19. Uh, and then of course, people like Peter Piot and King Holmes who've worked on Ebola and HIV have taken those lessons and have leveraged them to have impact on COVID-19. So it's, it's really wonderful to see how this, the people that we recognize have had an impact. So this is an interesting picture. It's one I'm gonna to use to go on and talk about uh, uh, CRISPR, but it's an interesting picture because this is the Gairdner Awards in 2016. It's a lovely picture. We're in the Royal Ontario Museum under the dome. It's a very beautiful spot. And when we get to uh, re reconvene in, per in person and have an actual real gala, we'll be there again. But in this picture, this is my first year as president of the foundation, that's me on the left, and I'm standing next to Tony Fauci. It was the year that he received the Canada Gardner Global Health Award. Also in this picture, are other people directly involved in uh, SARS and, and COVID-19 research. On the right is Frank Plummer, who unfortunately died that last year, but Frank Plummer was given the Whiteman Award for his work through the National Bi Microbiological Lab involved in HIV and Ebola vaccines, and clearly would have been front and center in all of the COVID-19 work. And then on the right is Lon Tyrell. He's not a Gardner awardee. He was actually at this time, he was the chair of the board of the foundation. And of course, Lon heads up the Lee Ka-shing Institute in uh, the University of Alberta, which is actively pursuing the virology of COVID-19 and looking for drugs and vaccines. And of course, is also the home for Michael Horton, who is one of this year's Nobel Prize winners. And then right in the middle, are what I call the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing quintet. Again, awarded five people for different aspects of developing this major new gene editing tool. And of course, coming out of that, we, we know that CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing has been an immensely uh, impactful tool coming out of bacteria, translated from bacteria into a tool that you can take uh, using the enzyme and guide RNAs and put in the cells of any organism from bacteria to plants, to animals, to humans, to cut DNA, splice DNA, put in insertions, replacements, very efficiently and very precisely. So it is absolutely revolutionizing many, many aspects. And of course, for that work, Jennifer Downer and Emmanuel Charpentier, who are part of our quintet, uh, won the Nobel Prize in chemistry last year. So what's CRISPR got to do with COVID-19? Well, both Jennifer Downer and Fong Zhang, who was one of the other of our awardees in 2016, have been developing using CRISPR approaches to develop rapid COVID tests that they think will be useful for point of care, genomic analysis, genomic detection, so very precise detection of uh, COVID-19. And in 
the, the way it works is that they use a different Cas9 enzyme that basically chops up the viral RNA into pieces that are then uh, mixed and associated with a reporter that can be detected on a detection strip like this. It's not quite like a pregnancy test. You do have to do something to, to get the enzyme going. So there is a machine involved, but the final readout is essentially like a pregnancy test. So in the middle, you see a lower band that's a negative. On the right, those are three positives with the upper band. And this has got uh, FDA uh, approval and is being starting to be rolled out in a number of cases. So just using their technology. So with, with all that then, so CRISP is important. And I built up that slide in 2016 and I've given everybody a role in COVID except myself. So, well, okay, okay, I have a role too. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how even in my lab, we've pivoted our research around COVID-19 and how it uses CRISPR. And I'm a mouse geneticist. And so one of the things that we can think about doing is developing better mouse models for COVID infection so that we can use the mouse as a, as a model for COVID infection, infect them with virus, test drugs, test vaccines, understand the biology, look at the genetics. But there's a problem. Mice actually don't get infected by COVID-19 because the mouse ACE2 receptor, it, it's in the same place, it exists, it does the same thing in the cells, but the virus, the spike protein from COVID-19 doesn't bind to the mouse ACE2 receptor. So what do you do? Well, with CRISPR, what we can do is replace the mouse gene with a human gene. And so that's what my lab decided to do. But to do that, we need to have a very efficient and fast way to make gene edited mice. We can't just sit around and think about this. The old ways we used to do it would take at least a year to even get maybe one mouse. Uh, we need a better way of doing it. We need to be more efficient. And so luckily uh, in my lab, two postdocs at the time, now they both have their own labs, Esther Postfi and Bin Gu, developed this technology, which we call uh, CRISPR gene editing, two cell CRISPR gene editing, where we take the components of the CRISPR gene editing uh, system and inject it into the cytoplasm of the egg at the two cell stage into both cells. And this gets taken up, edits the DNA very efficiently such that when you transfer these eggs back to the mouse, then what we find is that uh, up to 100% of the offspring actually carry the correct genetic alteration. So in this case, it looks like we injected a gene that makes the mice black. And so the black mouse is uh, carrying the alteration. And when you breed it, the offspring carry the mutation. So this is now a heritable alteration in the genome. So people, I always like to show this. This is how it works. The egg is tiny and we have to inject both cells. So we have to spin it around and take the, the, the pipette that has the solution in it has the Cas9 components and get the other cell as well. And you can see that the embryo has survived this and then can be injected back into the mum to complete gestation. This is the size of a speck of dust and you need a microscope to do the work. So Bin Gu really designed this project uh, and I've made it look simple here. We take a vector that contains the human CD cDNA for the human ACE2 gene with homology arms to the mouse chromosome. So on the X chromosome in the mouse, and with the right scissors from Cas9, we can replace efficiently the human cDNA with the mouse cDNA. And now the mouse chromosome carries the human cDNA. We began that project in May, 2020. Uh, and we've now shown that we made the mice, that the gene is expressed, grown up enough mice that now they've gone to Montreal to be tested for virus infection. And if they are infectable, then we'll be able to distribute these worldwide very, very soon. So, that's the kind of science, just an examples of the things that people do, everybody is doing to make sure that whatever we have as our own skills, we can translate to help COVID uh, situation. But let's get back to COVID-19. How can we actually now today uh, really think about treating and preventing the disease? So to do that, we need to understand, of course, how does our body get rid of the disease? And many, most people recover. Well, we recover because our immune system fights off the virus. So can we harness the immune system response to treat and prevent disease? So how does our system respond to the virus? This is taken from a Nature uh, uh, article here. So essentially the virus gets released from the cell and gets broken up. Little bits of protein get taken up by what are called antigen presenting cells. 
and those little bits of protein get put on the surface of the cell and are read, as it were, by T helper cells who then activate B cells and, T and cytotoxic T cells. The B cells activated by the little bit of viral peptide now make antibodies that respond to that peptide. And these antibodies can be neutralizing or bind to the virus and prevent it uh, bind into the cells or actually destroy it. Cytotoxic T cells also play a role because they will actually go away and destroy the infected cells. So those viral factories that we're manufacturing will be killed as well. Importantly, part of this immune response is to develop what are called memory cells, so long-lived memory B and T cells in, uh, that will hang around for a long time afterwards and recognize the virus and they'll, they'll, they'll be ready next time the body sees the virus. So it may not have seen it before, but now it has a memory so that it can rapidly respond and actually pr produce a very uh, rapid and input, uh, strong immune response. So that memory system is extremely important. And that's why it is that when we get infected with, with diseases, generally speaking, we get infected once, we should have some form of immunity to seeing that disease again. We hope that's the case with, with SARS-CoV-2, uh, with COVID-19. Uh, and it's, of course, we don't really know enough about it yet, but likely there will be some long-term immunity if you've been previously infected. But of course, importantly, this, this same process is what is used to develop vaccines. We don't give people living virus, but we give them the viral proteins, the little bits of, so they can be uh, taken up by the antigen presenting cells and start this whole process. So that again, when you see the virus, you'll be ready to respond. So we can harness, can we harness this to treat disease? Well, when patients do recover from infection, certainly in the short term, they will have neutralizing antibodies for a while in their body. They may not last forever, that's the memory part, but those antibodies could potentially kill viruses. So there's been quite a lot of interest as whether to, you could actually treat severe cases by capturing some of these, these neutralizing antibodies from recovering patients. There've been some studies using whole convalescent plasma, which haven't been terribly uh, uh, effective, but importantly, if you could find very strong neutralizing antibodies and turn them into a monoclonal, then you might have a, a real sort of drug-like molecule that you could use to treat patients. And this, of course, I have to tell people in Vancouver, this is a Canadian success story. A uh, company, Abcelera, here in Vancouver, has a platform technology for really screening for neutralizing antibodies from patient serum. And using that platform technology, isolated very strong neutralizing antibodies with Eli Lilly, turned it into a monoclonal antibody to potentially treat patients of severe disease. It has received emergency approval from the FDA and Health Canada, and it's in limited uh, clinical use today. And as of course, we also know that the platform technology and the expertise of Abcelera uh, led to a, a very successful IPO in December, setting an extraordinarily high uh, dollar value on this company. So this is, this is great. This is a potential help for severe disease, but it's emergency treatment. It's obviously not the way to protect us all. The way to protect us all is to develop vaccines. And vaccines basically work just like our immune system works against the virus. And you just imagine now instead of the virus, we put in viral pro a vaccine product. We put the viral proteins without the virus itself. So again, you're gonna get an initial exposure. Uh, you'll get a primary immune response. And then you hope that you get this memory so that when, the vi when the, you see the virus next time, so this is gonna be just the vaccine. When you come back with the virus, the memory cells remember it and you get a very rapid and very uh, effective secondary immune response. So it is very important, not just to get an immediate response and get antibodies, but to get this long-term memory if this is really gonna be worth, workable. So vaccines, this is probably the biggest success story of, of COVID-19 science. It's amazing to think that within a year, we have three or more vaccines approved for use and in patients now, and patients in people now. Uh, this is unbelievable. If you asked any vaccinologist, and I did, I asked Rino Rapioli, who, was, who received an award from the Gardner Foundation in an earlier uh, um, Gardner Global Health Panel, Global 
perspectives panel, I asked him, when do you think we can get a vaccine? He said, well, you know, normally it takes at least a few years. Maybe we could speed that up into sort of 18 months or two years. In fact, things have got sped up so remarkably that we are with safe and effective vaccines in, in people now. That's unbelievable. So it was a race, not a race against each other, really. But, you know, sometimes having some competition doesn't hurt. Uh, and it's certainly a race to get patients and people treat, uh, given these vaccines. This is from the New York Times. You can check it out any day. It keeps up, updating. This is the current uh, count on the vaccines that are being developed around the world. Uh, and as I say, it's, it's unbelievable how fast this has happened. Record time. So where are we at in Canada? So um, we obviously, as you know, we are starting to see vaccine rollout in Canada. And Canada has done a pretty good job at procuring vaccines. And it's been informed in that procurement by the Canadian Vaccine Task Force. And this is another sort of advantage I have in Gerdna. I have, I have connections in all sorts of ways, because in fact, Mark Levonen, who's the co-chair of the Canadian Vaccine Task Force, is also on the Gerdna uh, board of directors. So I had a conversation, which you can find on YouTube, with Mark about vaccines and where we sit in Canada. And in this particular section, I asked him, well, of all the vaccines that are coming forward, how many is Canada approving? And are there any Canadian ones that we can see coming down the pipe? So listen. You're talking about other vaccines that are coming down the road. There are, you said, there's a number of them. Are there any Canadian ones that are moving forward and being towards the front? Yes, yeah, so, so the COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force, uh, our, our role was to uh, advise the government of Canada about securing uh, safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines for Canadians. We have now provided advice to the government of Canada. On on seven vaccines and the government of Canada has announced that they have agreements uh, with these uh, seven uh, companies. Uh, they're across three different platform technologies, uh, actually four because there's the RNA, the viral vector, the protein subunit, and the virus-like particle, which is a vaccine introduced by Medicago. Medicago is the lone Canadian uh, company uh, in this race at this point in time, and that agreement was signed uh, just recently. And so that's very encouraging as well. So we have seven candidate vaccines across these three or four different platforms uh, that the government of Canada has entered into agreements with. And so that gives us a... So seven different vaccines and of different backgrounds and one of them Canadian, Medicago. So what are the, the advanced vaccine candidates that, that he's talking about? Um, so if we look at the different kinds of, of vaccine candidates that are being developed, the classic way of developing a vaccine is the whole, just to take the virus and inactivate it in some way and just inject that in people. And it works, but it can, it's not terribly safe and it's not always terribly effective. So this is what's been used in China at the moment. And just today, actually, I read a, a report that says this is about 50% effective. It's not what's really being developed and being procured in Canada at all. Uh, the ones that are in Canada right now are both RNA vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech. This is totally new technology and it's sort of simple. It's a bit like the virus. The virus has a bit of RNA that encodes proteins. So why don't we just take a piece of RNA that encodes the spike protein, wrap it up in some way that it can get into your cells and then use your cells to make the protein to develop the immune response. So that's the idea and I'll come back to that in a minute. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that you've probably also heard about is a bit more complicated. This time there is a vector, not just a piece of lipid wrapping up message. Uh, it's a vector that is a adenovirus vector. It's not an infective virus, but it has the ability to get into cells and it can carry the genes for uh, producing the spike protein. So that is the, the way the AstraZeneca one works. And then the one that was talked about, which is the Canadian one, I think is really intriguing because this is a very different approach and it's producing virus-like particles from plants. And so there's huge, uh, you have to have huge greenhouses in which these plants are actually actively producing these virus-like particles that carry the, the uh, spike protein and are immunogenic. 
It needs it to enhance the activity. You add what's called an adjuvant. This comes from uh, GlaxoSmithKline. And I just want to say again, in the sort of open science world, GlaxoSmithKline, headed by Rina Rapioli, has said, basically, we have the best adjuvants. We'll make them available to anybody worldwide who is developing a vaccine for free. So the adjuvant comes from GSK. So these are what's going on. But RNA vaccines were the first to be approved anywhere, and certainly the ones that only ones that have been approved so far in Canada. It is a totally new technology, never been approved before. It's always a little scary. Um, but there's some important Canadian connections here too, because uh, this Moderna, which is one of the two companies involved here, was headed up the founding scientist is somebody called Derek Rossi. And Rossi is a Canadian who I know well because he was a graduate student in Toronto and I was on his supervisory committee. He went off and ended up as a stem cell scientist in Harvard. And in 2010, he was trying to make reprogram cells to pluripotency to make stem cells uh, in the same way that Shinya Yamanaka used reprogramming factors to take skin cells and turn them into induced pluripotent stem cells but he wanted a better way of doing it, a rapid and non-infective way of doing this. And he thought, well, why don't we just put messenger RNA into the cells? So, you know, but the virus does, why don't we just throw messenger RNA into the cells, expressing these vectors, uh, these factors, and see if it will reprogram. Well, the problem was it didn't work because if you just put naked messenger RNA into your cells, cells have a var antiviral approach to get rid of that. They don't like it. And so most they, when he did that, all the cells died. But he was clever. He went looking in the literature and he read research from Kathleen Caracol and Drew Weissman at the University of Pennsylvania that suggested that you could get over this antiviral response if instead of the normal uh, base pairs, bases for RNA, you put artificial bases into it, then you could sidestep the antiviral response. So he tried that put the reprogramming factors and boom, very, very efficiently was able to make stem cells, worked first time. It was a big breakthrough in the stem cell field and he got a lot of recognition for that. But then he thought, well, you know, if we can make stem cells by expressing proteins, this is a technology where we could express all sorts of proteins. So why don't we think about setting up a company to explore other ways of using this technology? And that was the birth of Moderna not a stem cell company. So again, an example where you know, you're doing research in one area, you end up having an impact in totally different areas. So given that uh, I know Derek well, had a chance to have a conversation with Derek as well, just recently, just before Christmas, uh, amongst other parts of that conversation, which was quite wide ranging, we talked about the business model of Moderna. Like any biotech, you know, thinking about bringing a totally new, uh, therapeutic paradigm to patients and to ultimately to market to approval it was going we knew it was going to be a long-term uh, effort well now we're about to we're on the yeah. verge of emergency use authorization 10 years later the company was founded in in 2010 that's actually pretty fast quite frankly for a new technology um par uh, part of the challenge also was um because it could have application in you know, almost every aspect of biology that you can imagine. I mean, because proteins are involved in you know, essentially all cellular machinations uh, and disease pathology and, you know, and turns out they're the units of uh, vac vaccines and, and the like. So one of the challenges was what the heck are we gonna work on? You know, what, what are we gonna work on first? And, um, you know, because when you're thinking about that, particularly with a new technology, you want to sort of set the bar as low as possible that you can get over it as a proof of principle that that it works. Uh, you don't want to set a bar up here when you're first coming with a new technology. You know, let's just imagine, well, if we get into this particular cell in the brain and express this rare isoform of a protein, and it really only has to be in that cell and not any other cells, because then you're all going to die. I mean, that would be a terrible first application because your technical challenge is so gigantic. So though, I will say in the in the four years I was intimately associated with the company, vaccines didn't come up a single once, mm. uh, and the reason for that is uh, multifold, but largely, probably mostly because of the business model. So yes, the business model. 
there really isn't a good business model for companies to ahead of time think about making vaccines. And SARS in 2003, people were making vaccines. As soon as the disease went away, they stopped with the vaccines. The RNA vaccine approach, however, I think gives us hope that in the future, because it's so simple to make, we will be able to respond rapidly to any new disease. Here's another, just a little bit of another Canadian connection here that I just want to mention with the RNA vaccines. I told you they had to be wrapped up in lipid nanoparticles and not Moderna's vaccine, but the other one that comes from Pfizer-BioNTech was a Canadian connection because the lipid particles that are used in that vaccine come from another Vancouver company, uh, Acuitas, which is really a world leader in developing lipid nanoparticles. So good Canadian connections all the way through in these vaccine development. So where are we at? We're seeing vaccine vaccination is underway in several countries, including Canada. We're beginning with vaccinating the vulnerable before the population as a whole. So it's going to take quite a while for this to play through, even in you know, the developed world. And we're going to need strict public health measures for many months to come. But it's very important, and back to our global health issues that Gerner is involved and cares so much about, we have to have vaccination globally. We have to make sure that in Africa, South America, Asia, everywhere in the world, we have the access to vaccines because until that is done, this pandemic is not gonna go away. Protecting the, the global North won't protect us forever if we don't protect the global South as well. So that's a huge challenge. There are societal challenges that have been revealed during the pandemic that we cannot ignore for the future. It's obvious to all of us that there's been unequal impact on vulnerable and racialized communities. Inequities that we knew about, but we sort of didn't really do too much about, we cannot ignore for the future. There obviously is a huge economic impact, which also in turn has a, a most severe uh, impact on the vulnerable and the racialized. So balancing public health measures and economic recovery is gonna be a huge challenge. And there are many, many lessons that we have to learn so that the pandemic future looks different from the pandemic past. And there are lessons for science. I think they're usually actually quite positive lessons. First of all, I think it should be obvious even from just what I've talked about, that you have to keep funding basic science. You know, CRISPR, who knew bacterial yogurt manufacturing could lead you to tests for COVID-19. Uh, you know, working on stem cells leads to an RNA vaccine. You never know where the next breakthrough is going to come. The other thing is that this is a global enterprise. We, have to, we welcome, need to welcome diversity and encourage community engagement across the world to make these things happen and implement them fast. Something that's not so obvious and hasn't ha happened as much as it should, but needs to in the future is an integration of science with social sciences, because we talk a lot about public health measures, but we really don't know how to make those public health measures work in the community and the population. Because, you know, they say, well, we'll listen to the scientists. Well, you know, we can tell you as scientists what you should do. Uh, social scientists can help you say, well, this is how we persuade people to do this. And then finally, of course, open science initiatives have been critical and have proved their worth and there'll be no turning back. So I just want to finish, say, you know, again, it's my pleasure to be the president of the Gertner Foundation uh, and to celebrate research excellence because I think it's so important and I like this quote from the Globe and Mail in 2009. It says, outstanding research knows no boundaries. And I think I've made that clear today. The Gerner Awards, Canada's only international awards, are a source of inspiration for current and future medical research. They're from here, but they belong to the world. So uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Rassant. That was um, so interesting. And um, I know that uh, there's probably a lot of questions. Um, I really appreciate um, the way that you have gotten and found that perfect balance of uh, very deep scientific discovery, yet helping explain it in a way that many people can understand. It's also, um, I'm a little biased, but of course, it's always nice to hear that the Vancouver companies are being internationally recognized in their role in both the therapeutics and the vaccine development. And I think also as you closed, um, you know, there, there is a very important set of learnings that have come out of this with respect to 
the continued investment in basic science, recognizing uh, what is happening within our society and some of the vulnerabilities that we had within our society that are being exposed. And I really truly believe, clearly I'm biased because of where I sit, but I really do believe that there is no sector right now that is better positioned to help drive the economic recovery of our uh, province and our country, as well as addressing some of the complex health systems and society uh, issues that we have. So um, all of the life sciences leaders that are, <laughs> that are attending, I really encourage everybody to put your best foot forward because we have we are well positioned to solve many, many of the issues that we're facing today. With that, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Gavin Stewart. He's a highly respected leader in the life sciences sector. He's the uh, professor um, within the department of OBGYN, former Dean of the Faculty of Medicine from 2003 to 2015, former Vice Provo Health from 2009 to 2016. In addition, as many people would know, he's very generous with his time sitting on multiple boards and committees. He currently sits on Genome BC board. He is the chair of the Clinical Trials BC Advisory Board, and he's one of our longest uh, standing life sciences BC board members. Um, and that is just a snapshot of the many things that uh, Dr. Stewart is involved in. So with that, Dr. Stewart, over to you to lead the Q&A. Thanks very much, Wendy. And I, I'll just say my personal thank you to Dr. Assant for what I thought was a, a stellar and succinct summary of much of the science around COVID. And I thought that was a, a, a wonderful presentation. Maybe just to, to start off, Dr. Assant, I might just uh, ask, you, you referred to the accelerated process of vaccine discovery as being uh, never heard of before. Could you maybe just speculate in terms of lessons learned for science, what, what do you think were the critical factors that successfully compressed that vaccine development the way we've seen it? Well, I think obviously, first of all, everybody was very um, uh, sort of ready to do it. I mean, they were, really wanted to make it happen. A lot of, there was a lot of investment from governments and other agencies to make it happen. So, that, you know, you build from a, a standing start. But also, I think some of the new technologies, particularly the RNA vaccines, were really ready to be translated much more rapidly than some of the more uh, original vaccine developments. So it was really initial in investment, initial uh, excitement by the people involved to get to get it moving, and then, but very importantly, once you've got the vaccine, two other things that come into play. So you can make a vaccine perhaps quite fast, you can test it and make sure it sort of works. You then have to produce it in large amounts and you have to get it approved. And we know that the production in large amounts, there's been a lot of discussion whether Canada was ready to do this and maybe not, but a lot of, uh, it will be in the future. Uh, and I think there were uh, a lot of other companies around the world ready to, to scale up the manufacturing but perhaps even more importantly is the uh, approval process because normally that's what really, really slows it down. You have to have clinical trials. So nobody went without clinical trials, but the, the approval process through the FDA, through Health Canada and other agencies was speeded up and they, they did basically what they called parallel approval. So they would keep getting it. They didn't wait till they got all the information and then spend months going through it and try and decide whether to approve or not to approve. They were approving as the, as the information was coming in, they were looking at it and saying, we approve this, but we need to know that. And so that really shrunk the approval process. So I think there's a number of different aspects uh, that were important there. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question from uh, Karima Asabar that uh, many of us know well. Uh, she, she's asked for comment on investment, or, or she's made the statement that investment in basic science research is important, but investment in infrastructure and the entire ecosystem is also needed to advance towards the commercialization and application. But could you comment on that? Please? Yes, I think I sort of I touched on that just briefly in my last last comment, but I think absolutely, uh, you know, the basic uh, research has to be translated. And if we just just looking at vaccines alone, I mean, we know that there has to be an, an, a, an investment in the infrastructure for scale up and, and manufacturing. Um, Medicago, for example, you may have read uh, their production at the moment is going to be done in the US because they have a facility there. And it's been slow for them to get the money to build the, the major facility that they do have planned uh, in Quebec, you know, 
now they've got the investment, but things are behind. So, but you know, it's very hard for governments to always set tell ahead of time. You know, everybody wants them, them, them to be in their infrastructure to be invested in. So, you know, who do you choose? How do you know? But I think we, what we've learned from this pandemic is that we better be ready to make vaccines because this is COVID-19, there will be more. There is, you know, there in our global world in which we live uh, and the way that these viruses could spread and mutate, uh, it's, does, it, it's very unlikely that we won't see other outbreaks of this sort. And the only way what we want to be do is to be ready with that when those outbreaks come to have vaccine development at an even faster rate than it is now. So, so yes, I absolutely agree. And, and, and thank you. Uh, Doug Buchanan has asked about the integration of uh, medical and social sciences that you've uh, referred to, but uh, he's asked for your thoughts on uh, extending this integration into topics like resistance, taking back things and, and the logistical challenges we're seeing. Yeah, well, certainly the, the vaccine resistance is, a, is, I think, a good example of where you absolutely need a a connection between the scientists who can help explain what makes a safe vaccine and what's not a safe vaccine, and you know, behavioral scientists and psychologists and other people who can help us try to understand how to what makes people hesitant. We have to understand why they don't want to take the vaccines. And that's not a scientific issue. That's something that we have to understand in a more integrated manner. And so I think this is an important area. I was quite um, positively surprised by the, the yesterday, I guess, there was a uh, survey uh, done in Canada of whether people wanted to take the vaccine and the, the uptake rate was actually surprisingly high. Um, but there will be, and there are, of course, um, vaccine resistors. And it is important that we get the vaccine out to as many people as possible to, in order to essentially achieve what we call herd immunity. So if we have a large proportion of the population who don't get vaccinated, we will still have potential outbreaks. So this is an important area and there are going to be, there are developing initiatives. And I know the government is very interested in developing initiatives, initiatives to try to look at how to bring these things together to influence people. On the logistics side, um, yeah, I guess that's also a social science aspect as well. I think it's more of a, it is a logistical issue. Uh, it requires people with, with expertise in logistics uh, um, that uh, can really deal with large, how to, bring things to, to people in an in a, a active way. Uh, we've done that in the past. I'm sure it's possible in the future. I'm going to go out of order here a little bit, Dr. Sander, because there is a question just asking what role the Gardner Foundation would play in bringing together the social sciences and the basic uh, sciences. Uh, that's a good question. In fact, it's something that we're looking at right now. Um, we're in the middle of our strategic planning process. Uh, and what, you know, what we see in the Gern, as our role in the Gardner Foundation is obviously to celebrate excellence, but also to try to use that to leverage our expertise and help uh, Canadians understand the impact of science and how it affects their lives. And so, in fact, one of the things that we're looking at right now is some of the issues around misinformation, uh, vaccine hesitancy, and how we might be able to work by providing some uh, obviously solid scientific background, but work with social influencers and other people to put that information out in the context and in the forms where it can be taken up by a broader range of Canadians. Do I have the answers? No, but is this something that's on our agenda? Yes, it is. Well, thank you. And uh, Alex Radecchia has asked that uh, you, you noted that the world scientific community has quickly rallied to address the emergency that is COVID. What's your impression, or is there a sense in the circle of science that this has this changed the research community's mm -hmm. desire or intent to share discoveries more freely in non-emergent situations? Well, I mean, I think that's where, open, where the open science initiatives come, come into play. If, if I were Guy Rouleau, he would be standing here and saying, absolutely, uh, and that, you know, open science is going to continue to grow. And I think it's interesting um, that they... Uh, with Guy, we had an open science symposium in November, I guess, uh, and uh, many, many people who I would not have expected to say, yes, this is the right way to go forward, said, you know, you're right, this is the way to go forward. So I think it will change. As I said, when we talked uh, earlier about the vaccine, there is a degree of competition. Scientists, uh, you know, they like to win, um, but there's a difference between 
competing uh, and not in a, competing in an open environment versus competing in such a way that you, you don't share information and you keep it so close to your chest that you're not allowing a broad impact of other people who can enhance your science. I mean, that's the main thing about open science is that none of us have all the answers. So the best way to build a full answer to a, to a problem is to have as many different voices, diverse, global, uh, different backgrounds, coming together. So I think it will change. I do believe it will change. Will it change everybody? Probably not. But I think it's something you're going to see the funding agencies and everybody else really pushing for in the future. Well, maybe if uh, Wendy will allow me, I'll, I'll try and get one, one more question in here, which is uh, from Kelly McNagy, who commented that you, you, you gave a great comment on previous basic research jumpstarting the response to COVID. But could you comment on the on the reverse COVID funding that jumpstarts other research? And he's he's given an example of the fascinating observation that a shocking number of severe COVID patients have pre-existing autoantibodies to mm -hmm. IFNA, and the likelihood this could lead to a better understanding of viral infections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, that's one one aspect. The other one I, I mentioned briefly, you know, is almost certainly genetic component here. So actually, people are already sort of screening the people by their genome to see whether there are specific uh, mutations that make people more or less susceptible. And those are, again, actually in the same pathways that, that Kelly's looking at here. So I think you're seeing a convergence. And of course, that's going to translate into more research on these pathways and how the impact on COVID and other diseases. So yes, it's absolutely a lot to be learned in all directions. Thank you. Um, Wendy, would you like me to turn this back to yourself? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, well, thank you both. Um, Dr. Rassant, your, your uh, talk was, was excellent and uh, extremely informative and enlightening. And I think you've also gone beyond just talking about the science and, and the broader societal and economic impacts, which is a conversation that really needs to continue. And as we saw through the Q&A, there's lots of appetite for that. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Stewart, for moderating the Q&A. Uh, we really appreciate, appreciate uh, your participation in this event. And I'd like to thank the Gardner Foundation. Uh, this is the third year we've partnered um, to host the lecture series, and we look forward to doing it again in the future. Um, we, at each event, uh, talk about what our upcoming um, events are. So just want to draw for everyone's attention. Next Friday is our second annual Career Connect Day presented by BioTalent Canada. We have um, a long list of uh, fantastic speakers within the community, HR leaders, um, industry and scientific leaders that are gonna share their thoughts and perspectives on careers in life sciences. Um, as of right now, we have 383 people registered. So uh, it's clearly a popular event. Um, in February, we have our Western Canada Partnership Series, um, which is done in collaboration with Manitoba and Alberta, and our annual Access to Innovation Conference is at the end of February. Uh, we have a second Western Canada Partnership event in March, and then our Showcase Series in Victoria as well. So thank you all for attending. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors who without whose support we uh, would not exist and not be able to do the many things that we do. So we're showing them here, our Platinum, Ferris, GSK, Janssen and Pfizer and our gold sponsors, Admare, Blake's Innovative Medicines Canada and Stem Cell Technologies. And with that, it is right on the hour. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you again to Dr. Rosant and Dr. Uh, Stuart, and we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you very much, Wendy.